And what a weekend that was. I'd give anything to be back there. I'd give anything to be back in Bristol on that weekend. One thing I can add to my completed list now. Last of Us. Four years it took me to actually start playing it. And a further seven months to actually get around to completing it. Naughty Dog did it again. Another masterpiece to go with Uncharted 4. But in all seriousness, just hope Den Revance is okay. Ugh, nothing major. Hello, my fellow Latter day Saints. Kenzie Bretchel, the Mormon Entertainer here, the most inspirational Mormon in the world ever. Share back once again. Welcome to this week's edition of the Trophy Achieving Podcast, your one stop shop for all the latest gaming news, rumours, and all sweet points and trophies. No points, in tro no points or trophies this week, but as you guys saw on the intro over the course of the last couple of days and for the next week, is that Demi Lovato in hospital. The latest, uh, the latest article I read was she's preparing for heading into rehab. Um, uh, she's in a stable condition. Demi saying she's actually considering returning to rehab. Just goes to show you that as one of my friends told me earlier this week you're never truly off it. You're, at the end of the day you're always going to the end of the day, there's going to be people that are always going to have those demons that they just need a release from. And a lot of the time they resort to drugs and alcohol and other things that are recreational. But anyway, Demi. Keeping you, in, keeping you in my thoughts and prayers, and I hope that you make a speedy recovery. So let's get into the news. But before that, gotta get this posted away because it's in there. Completed the last of us. Didn't 100% it, didn't get the platinum trophy. But, wow, what a game it was. What a game. So anyway, uh, I'll be sending that back to Boomerang Rentals. Packages start from as little as three ninety nine a month. Sign up today, get a twenty one day free trial, and you get three free game rentals as well. And not just that, there are no late fees, so you can keep the game as long as you like to, like I say, one hundred percent it or get the platinum trophy or whatever. We'll keep it forever at a discounted price on the online store. BoomerangRentals.co.uk The best place to rent your games. Alright, let's 
What do we have here? Right, we've got some uh, Pokemon Go news to kick off proceedings. All right, so here we go. Let's so let's go into the uh, Pokemon Go Lucky Pokemon. How to increase your chances of getting said Lucky Pokemon. So here we go. Um, Pokemon Go Lucky Pokemon is another type of Pokemon to look out for, joining shinies form and forms such as the Lowland Pokemon. While the aforementioned types only fill up Pokedex, Lucky Pokemon status also provides a direct benefit allowing that creature up allowing that creature up at much a, a <sighs> proofreading guys have you not heard of it direct benefit allowing that creature to power up at a much cheaper cost than regular pokemon what are pokemon lucky pokemon and pokemon go lucky pokemon is a special status separate to forms or shinies that Pokemon can have attached to them. If a Pokemon is lucky, then the Stardust required to power it up is reduced by 50%. The feature is particularly welcome as Stardust is one of the most, more scarce resources in the game, especially at high level play, allowing creatures to reach maximum CP at a lower cost. How to get lucky Pokemon in Pokemon Go? Lucky Pokemon come from the game's trading feature. When you trade, there's a chance both creatures will have the lucky status afterwards. The success rate isn't yet known, but the longer the Pokemon has been in storage, in other words, the longer you've owned the Pokemon, the higher the chances of it becoming lucky by the end of it. So if the Pokemon are from when the game launched in 2016, your chances of them being lucky will be much higher than if it were caught this year. If they were caught at different time, if they are caught at different times, it's suspected the game will take the average age of both creatures in the trade as the calculation, as either both, as either both will or won't be lucky together. That's not to say a freshly caught Pokemon can't be lucky. Members of the community have been successful with trading recent catches, but the older it is, the better. Since you can only trade one of a specific Pokemon, you want to, you want those chances to be as high as possible. What else? Um, what else you need to know about Lucky Pokemon? Lucky Pokemon have high IVs, starting from 10, 10, 10 from HP, Defense, and Attack, or around 80%. This means you can turn a rubbish Pokemon into a more competitive one. Note this wasn't the case at launch, so if you hear otherwise, Niantic appears to have fixed this since. <clears throat> There doesn't appear to be a cap on how many lucky Pokemon you can get in one day. Originally there was thought to be, but reports from the Silph Road suggest either a cap was lifted or was incorrect information. <coughs> <coughs> lucky isn't a search term when looking through your Pokemon collection, right now at least. Pokemon can be shiny and lucky, thanks Reddit. This July 2018 update also comes with a number of other features, including filter options for the friends list and ability to give nick and the ability to give nicknames, tweaks to gifts, 200 XP for each one cent, and the ability to delete unwanted gifts. Ooh. Being able to search for traded Pokemon in your Pokemon box and see the time remaining on in progress raids. Enjoy! Can I handle that? August Research Breakthrough Rewards Pokemon Go's August field research is set to focus on electric-themed challenges and Johto region creatures. The quests are scheduled to rotate on the first of the month and at that point, trainers will be also be able to claim their first Pokemon Go August Research Breakthrough and start a new month of special encounters. In August, 
Pokemon Go players will be able to secure special encounters with Raikou every time they receive seven field research steps. Many players were disappointed at the start of July since the Snorlax was the first non-legendary reward, but the meta-relevant Raikou is getting a much more positive reaction. No kidding, it's legendaries! We want legendaries! Niantic confirmed the August Research Breakthrough reward both on social media and with an in-game notification. Trainers, we have an electrifying announcement for you. August Field Research Task will focus on electric Pokémon. Hmm, shock and surprise. Also, if you collect enough stamps to earn a research breakthrough, you'll have an opportunity to catch the legendary Pokémon, Raikou. Raikou is a very strong Pokémon in, Pokemon in the Pogo metagame, and is a strong addition to many battle rate lines. Even though many players already caught this electric type at the end of last summer, last year that is, the chance to get extra candy and maybe a higher IV spawn is definitely appealing. The return to a legendary research breakthrough is also good news for rural players who were counting on monthly rewards to help them complete their Pokedex, Pokedex entries without participating in many legendary raids. We'll be sure to post a full list of August field research tasks as soon as the community has discovered all of them. So, so check back for that in a week or so. Until then, good luck out there trainers! Pokemon Go is currently available in select regions on Android and iOS devices. And also, Registeel is available in raids right now as well. Right. Overwatch news now. And we've got another free weekend. Huzzah! This week was a big week for Overwatch, with the introduction of its brand new hero, Wrecking Ball. <coughs> HAMMOND! The finals of the Overwatch League season between the London Spitfire. Sounds like a Spitfire. 999 sounds like a Messerschmitt. <laughs> and the Philadelphia Fusion. In addition to adding its 28th character to the roster this week, Overwatch also announced a free to play weekend. As of today, all Overwatch fans, as well as anyone who has not tried out the award winning game before, can play for free on PC up until Monday, July 30th. Speaking of which, where are you? Ba 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 Game of the Year edition. 15 quid a game. If that's not a steal, I don't know what is. The free to play weekend will be available in two most regions, including the Americas, Europe, Asia, minus Korea, in order to access the event. Minus Korea? Korea's a very big gaming market, and you miss them out? Shame on you, Blizzard! Shame! 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 Ding ding ding! Shame! Ding ding ding! Shame! Ding ding ding! In order to access the event, the players simply need to register for a Blizzard account via the Overwatch Free Weekend client, which also went live today, and download the game. From there, players will have to access the full will have access to the full roster of heroes, including Overwatch's new hero, Wrecking Ball, Hammond, as well as all 18 maps in the game. In addition to that, all game modes such as Quick Play, Arcade, and Custom Games will also be available to try out this weekend. Achievements are disabled for the free to play weekend, unfortunately, but players will still have the ability to level up and earn loot boxes. First time Overwatch players will also be happy to know that the progress they make during this free to play weekend will be saved, should they decide to be buy the game later after trying it out. I've done it. As you just all saw there, I have my own copy of the game at last. With additional changes recently made to characters such as Symmetra, who can now launch her turrets, and Hanzo, who can now air dash and shoot a string of back-to-back -back arrows, the game is now more fun than ever. It is therefore a great time for fans that have not played Overwatch in a while, and for new players to join the game and to be able to experience why the game now boasts over 40 million active subscribers. Do we mean active players? Overwatch is out now on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Oh, we've got another free weekend on the cards. Now, 
Fortnite news now, and we've got two articles on it. Um, Fortnite developer Epic Games thought to be worth eight billion, with a B, capital B, bold, underlined, eight billion dollars. But before that, Fortnite on Android to be timed exclusively for Samsung's Note 9. Hmm. Interesting. Fortnite Epic Games' incredibly popular Battle Royale shooter will finally be coming to Android, but as a Samsung Galaxy Note 9 exclusive for 30 days. Both 95 Google and XDA developers report, citing sources. 95 Google also reports that pre order bonuses for the Galaxy Note 9 will include $100 to $150 worth of Fortnite V-Bucks for in game use. The sourced report lines up nicely with previous reports that Samsung's next phone will be gaming centric. XDA developers report that the phone's new S Pen will have Fortnite integration which will allow players to use it for shooting and aiming. The site also reports the phone will have a vapor chamber heat pipe to deal with the sort of cooling issues that come along with long gaming sessions. It will also have, they report, 128 gigabytes of storage, 6 gig of RAM and run on either Exynos 9810 or Qualcomm Sp Snapdragon 845 chip, depending on the region. While rumours also note a large battery, no rumour seems to touch on the refresh rate of the phone. An important aspect of gaming on the phone. While rumours seem to align for the bigger discussion um, around Samsung's push into the lucrative mobile gaming market, the notion of Epic Games allowing a specific platform to have a special sort of controller seems out of line with the company's approach. Epic, game. Epic currently doesn't support any controllers on the iOS version specifically to combat an uneven playing field on the mobile platform. The invitation for Samsung's major unveiling event, Samsung Galaxy Unpacked, shown below, seems to show a close-up of, of a yellow S Pen's button. The event is August 9th in New York City. Rumour has the phone hitting in late August which means that the rest of the Android phone users should be getting Fortnite by September. Neither Samsung nor Epic Games responded to Variety's request for comment. Interesting. Okie dokie. There we go. Fortnite developer F Epic Games thought to be worth $8 billion. Victory Royal Deeds. Here we go. James can't stop buying $20 Fortnite skins, and now it appears Fortnite developer is worth $8 billion. Go figure. According to Bloomberg via gamesindustry.biz, Fortnite is set to accure $2 billion this year alone, and according to Bloomberg Billionaires Index, the developer is now valued between $5 billion and $8 billion. This figure includes all of Epic's business ventures, including its Unreal Engine. This also makes Tim Sweeney, Epic's CEO and founder, a billionaire. Good on him. As reported by Tyler at the time, the Chinese internet company Tencent owned 40% of Epic Games back in 2013. Epic was then valued at $825 million, which, for the sake of perspective, is was well overshadowed by League of Legends 1 billion 
dollar tra microtransaction haul the following year. Back to the present day, and Bloomberg support says, says based on trading, multiples of peers, Electronic Arts Inc. and Activision Blizzard Inc. Or Electronic Arts Stink, in this case. You're welcome. Epic could be worth as much as $14 billion. Oof. Chump change. It does, however, qualify this by saying potential buyers may demand a discount regarding Fortnite's scope for sustaining revenue growth. I don't claim to understand the world of finance, but the Battle Royale's widespread global influence makes the above easy to believe. From the World Cup final to Funko Pop figurines, it doesn't look like Fortnite's appeal is faltering either. And he's not wrong about that. Not wrong on that. News on Forza, Forza Motorsport 7 now. Ooh, good to hear. For the Motorsport 7 will turn a year old in October, and developer Turn 10 is planning a major change. To one of its most controversial systems. No, one of the most controversial systems in the whole of gaming history. You can thank you, Ian Stolz, for the truth of that one. Scandal Front 2 River uh, Attack. In Forza Motorsport 7, the familiarity of driving your favorite cars on beloved tracks goes hand in hand with the joys of discovery. It's about owning sporty cars priced just out of reach in real life. There's exhilaration driving on roads you visited countless times and still finding something new. And whether you're preoccupied with a pack of driver cars or real life competitors, Forza 7 is abundant in different ways to compete. Only Forza 7 money. strips away the often amusing of ostentatiousness of motorsport that decorated the series' last few games. Forza 7 relies less on wooing you with superficial spectacles and instead lets the cars and courses speak for themselves. This break from the ceremonious aspects of motorsport is a welcome one, especially when all you want to do is race. The career mode alone encourages you to get down to business in a wide array of competitions spread across six championship series. Since you don't need to enter all the races to win the cup, you're offered the flexibility to compete with the types of cards you're most used to. Conversely, the opening races do remind you of Forza 7's vehicle variety, encouraging you to play outside your comfort zone. Even after you finish the career mode, the quest to build a respectable collection of cars goes on. The draw of browsing the hundreds of cars in Forza 7 want, is the tease of this purchasing is all a new EA's model, like the 2017 Nissan GTR, or scratching that nostalgic itch with a Pacer X from the now defunct American Motors Corporation. In this position. And while the recent withdrawal of Lexus and Toyota production models from racing games leaves a void in this robust roster, Turn 10 helps cushion a blow with a hearty selection of Porsches, a manufacturer that was missing from the launch version of Forza 6. The Friends as AI Drivatars return as a pleasing alternative to age-old CPU racing behaviors like rubber banding. Online, you'll find, more often than not, disorderly strangers who are as impolite as they are careless. The alternative, of course, is participating in private races, provided you can convince other friends to do their best at avoiding crashes. For the least chaotic approach to measuring and comparing greatness, Rivals presents a host of tough, yet worthwhile, asynchronous contests where you attempt to beat other players' lap times. The last couple Forza Motorsports, along with Forza 7, are engrossing due to their true-to-life tracks and how surrounding environments are enhanced by changes in weather and time of day. Yet whereas Forza 6 had a pre-made rain condition for select tracks, Forza 7 has an impressive 16 variations of inclement weather like thunderclouds and summer drizzle. Road Atlanta on an overcast day can exude the secluded quaintness of 
a course in the UK, like the Top Gear test track. The right combination of car and weather conditions can give you a newfound appreciation for a track you've raced on hundreds of times in other games. This is how you treat your customers. What has always set Forza Motorsport apart from other racing sims is the high degree of newcomer-friendly accessibility options. Many of Forza 7's challenges arise when you've tweaked your settings just right so first place wins are hard fought. And with the return of mod cards, originally introduced in Forza Motorsport 6, you can self-impose other performance incentives for greater rewards. Mods are unlocked as part of Forza 7's blind card system, known as prize crates. These packs evenly mix practical items like cars and mods. Only, only EA could see that, but they won't. But they'll never see it because they are, will. They will always be the first order in this case, and will never deviate from that. They rule upon us like a mighty galactic empire. It's because they are the mighty galactic empire. Bandai Namco has shared new details on its DLC plans for Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom. The publisher will release three packs of additional content for the RPG over the next few months, one of which is scheduled to arrive in August. The Adventure Pack DLC launches on August 9th and will be available for free for everyone who owns the game. It adds an assortment of new challenges aimed at experienced players, along with new flaws for the Far Away Forest Cave. The DLC introduces two new bosses to battle, Blackheart and Zeta. And additional quests that will be unlocked after completing the main story. Players will also be able to get new costumes and other rewards. The two, the remaining two DLC packs will be reserved for those who purchase Nino Kuni 2's $20 season pass. Well, at least we're getting some DLC free. The first is slated to arrive this winter and will introduce an enigmatic new dungeon that features progressively more challenging enemies as players delve deeper into it. The second expansion is expected to release in early 2019 and will add new story content. Additional details of these DLC packs will be shared later. The most recent update for Nino Kuni 2 arrived back in June along with an assortment of bug fixes and quality of life improvements. It introduced two new difficulty options, Hard and Extreme. Ooh, excellent! More trophies, ladies and gentlemen! Both of which feature a higher quality, equi a higher quality equipment and item drops than the standard normal load. Nino Kuni 2 is available on PS4 and PS, uh, PC. GameSpot awarded it an 8 out of 10 in our Nino Kuni 2 review. Critic Peter Brown wrote, It's chock full of excellent battles and surprising moments that make a far more memorable experience that make for a far more memorable experience than you initially expect and leaves you impressed by your own accomplishments if you didn't play the first game don't let this one pass to you but i too i wonder if are we able to play the first game of Goody? Hmm. <coughs> right. Next up, Hello Games responds to save issues linked with No Man's Sky's latest update. Some players are reporting No Man's Sky's latest update is wiping their progress. Oh, uh oh, spaghettios. As detailed by Kotaku, even though the hours played summary on the save data appears to be correct. Affected save files are reverting to the beginning of the game. The issue has been reported across all platforms and usually cannot be resolved by loading a previous save. While some savvy PC players have found a workaround for now, unless console players have an old save backed up on disk rather than an HD rather than an HDD or cloud save, it appears the issue cannot be fixed for those playing on PS4 or Xbox One. Oh, goody goody gumdrops. Sean Murray tweeted out saying a new build has been sent to experimental on PC 
this will go live to everyone on PC soon. Hotfix patches are in flight for PS4 and Xbox. MS Sony Search means this is a tiny bit slower, but will be with you ASAP. Catering to the PC masters before anybody else. <laughs> Congratulations. Fail. Founder of Hello Game, Sean Murray, has responded. Oh, I've literally just read that. At the time of writing, Hotfix 1.51 has been displayed has been deployed on PC, which includes a fix for the save game issue. The PS4 and Xbox One patches are currently with the respective teams awaiting certification. Hello Games asked players to note that if the game has not been resaved, then progress has not been lost and will be recovered. What does that what does that mean? Resave? What does that mean? No Man's Sky's big 1.5 update called Next rolled out earlier this week on PC, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. The patch adds a large number of new features and quality of life improvements to the two-year-old space survival game, including a cooperative multiplayer mode. Which was... meh. You and your team need to get things done. With Monday.com, it's easy, fun, and simple. Mention your team. Well, your well, team. well. Files, if it isn't gaming tasks, Satan, stay in control on the go with the our Galactic Empire. Go to Monday.com, create your free account, and get addicted to getting things done. And what do they have in store for us this time around? Let's find out. EA Get Studio. something I know a lot of you have been asking for. Making something mm -hmm. It's Royale. It's Royale reimagined for Battlefield. So we bring those pillars of Battlefield with destruction, team play, vehicles into this new experience. So we will bring you experience that you haven't played before in Battlefield or anywhere else. Oh, that's another studio they're going to shut down. More about that later this time. EA said in the I don't know exactly what the field for you working on because you need to tell us. But now, now EA, 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 Blake Jordan has reached the You hypocrites! If you want an earnings, earnings call, Jordanson so the Star Wars innovative. name is Jedi so Fallen Order. So it kind of gives you some idea and that you'll be playing a Jedi. It years. takes place and during by the dark that times. Never! Here, but when the Jedis are being so hunted, said, so EA was attracted it's going to be spectacular. All right, so, so we can I shut them down in a few years. People want to know, like, what, when can we play the game? Uh, it will be company, a holiday of next year, and they are going to ruin said ideas. So I'm excited to confirm that Battlefront 2 this year will be going deep into the Clone Wars. <laughs> the leader of the most powerful droid army in the galaxy, General Grievous. And yes, he will be going up against my own personal favorite, Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. So, but we're, we're not done, that's not it. They will not come alone. Joining them is the Dark Lord and leader of the Separatist Alliance, Count Dooku as well as someone to bring balance to the force, Obi-Wan's unruly Padawan, Anakin and in Skywalker. All the one, we can set you down, and we can put you on high. Your bungee. Bungee! He experimented with outsourced game covers, and that's why those games, after that he like this game, he was trying to install the code of the game and black box for the Caribbean Armada of the Dead. Okay. Next up, official Nintendo Switch GameCube controllers debut in time for Smash Bros. Ultimate. Excellent. <coughs> 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 Uh, excuse my 
won't. It's not 100%. Three designs replete with switch menu buttons. Nintendo and accessory maker Hori have announced three new GameCube controllers designed to work specifically with the Nintendo Switch. These control these controllers come in three styles fashioned after the other company after the company's most popular franchises, Super Mario, Legend of Zelda, and Pokemon. All of the controllers take the color schemes of and the logo of the games they represent in trans in translocked. In, in translucent, translucent, no slip grip shells. Likewise, each of these controllers feature buttons up for, up for the Switch's menu functions. The plus, <sighs> minus, and plus buttons, as well as screenshot and home buttons. However, in the center of those buttons rests a turbo button with three settings that will execute five, ten, or twenty times per every second you hold the button. A button. Hori has also added a ZL button that the original GameCube controller didn't have. And the company made all four of these shoulder buttons reassignable. Ooh, goody! Points for accessibility. Now here's the stinger. These controllers are all wired over a USB connection, which means they can only be used when connected to the Switch via its dock. Hori has priced these controllers at ne nearly 3,000 yen for an October launch in Japan, which converts to about $26 or 20 quid or 36 Australian dollars, which will probably be about 25 euros. Or maybe 20 euros as well. Anyway, of course, this release timing is just perfect for the upcoming launch of Smash Bros. Ultimate in December. This. Should these controllers make it over to the West for a wider release, it's safe to expect to pay around 30 bills in your region for one. Hmm. Oh. H1Z1 Battle Royale officially launching on PS4 next month and wait, is that a battle pass? And the sub and the subheading for it is I thought that progression menu looked awfully familiar. Well let's find out and see what it's all about. Let's have a look and see what it's all about. Epic Games might be seeing setting new speed records for its weekly updates to Fortnite Battle Royale, but let's not forget the game that technically still isn't even out yet, but has remained in early access for almost a year despite being treated as a full release on all major respects. In all major respects. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, H1Z1 Battle Royale released a PS4 beta in May, racking up an impressive 10, pl 10 million plus player, account player count in the process, and is officially launching the game next month on August the 7th. As explained by H1Z1's producer Terence Yi in a PS blog post, What's more, developer Daybreak Games is releasing a ton of new content and services for the free-to-play free -play Battle Royale game, celebrating the upcoming release, including a new subscription which bears an uncanny resemblance to anyone who spent more than, uh, more than a minute with Fortnite. Yes, H1Z1 is getting a battle pass, complete with 45 day seasons, 30 unlock tiers, and an in-game currency that can be used to buy different items on an ad hoc basis. It's unclear how much 
a battle pass will cost you, but seeing as Fortnite appears to have been the clear reference points for Daybreak, you could expect to see it around in a seat in the area for $7.99 or $7.99 or $9.99. A small difference from Fortnite, however, is that PS Plus members have access to their own progression tier, which will unlock exclusive items as they progress throughout the season. On top of that, Daybreak will be adding an RPG, M40 sniper rifle, ARV vehicle, and a handful of purchasable bundles to H1Z1 Battle Royale, which include special costumes and skins to don during those nail-biting PvP matches. H1Z1 Battle Royale will remain free to play as a fully launched product, but anyone who's been playing on in open beta will have their progress transferred over to the full game with the, up with the incoming update so owners of that classy unicorn mask need not worry. And again, that takes me back to my previous point of this is how you treat your customers. This is how, this is how you do it. It just really bugs me that EA can't see this. Mind you, it's EA, they never learn. PUBG game apologizes for offensive mask. Okay, makers of the makers of online deathmatch game player unknowns battlegrounds or PUBG have apologized after the design of an in-game item upset some Korean fans. Ooh, that's a little um What's the word I'm looking for? Concerning? That is a little bit concerning. Yeah. Hopefully we don't uh, have any issues with it. Well, any major issues. On Saturday, a pilot's mask which appeared to feature a rising sun design was added to the game's store. Many Korean and Chinese people found the symbol offensive because it was used by the Imperial Japanese military. The developers have removed the item and have refunded players who bought it. <laughs> PUBG is owned by South Korean video game publisher Bluehole. The controversy was reported by Korean language news site Bizet. Many Koreans consider the rising flag, rising sun flag, a throwback to Japan, Japan's imperial system and militarism during its World War II expansion into Asia. On the same day, a player found that one of the game's artificial intelligence bots was named Unit 731 by the developers. Unit 731 was a division of the Japanese army which developed chemical weapons and conducted human experiments on Chinese, Korean, and Russian prisoners of war. 10,000 people died in its testing facilities? Good grief! The company said the AI bot's name would be removed from the game, and the pilot's mask was not supposed to be released to players. Then why did you make it in the first place? Yeah, that pretty much confirms we've just had our gaming screw-up of the week. It promised to scrutinise items before they went... It promised to scrutinise items before they went on sale in the future. Why didn't you do this from the start? Idiots. We apologise for causing concerns over a pilot mask item. The company said in a statement, <laughs> Bit late for that now. Bit late for that now. 
we will conduct an overall re-examination of our pr image pr production process to prevent such a recurrence. Good luck with that. We will enhance procedures to scrutinize game items before their release and hold the person in charge responsible. Again, that begs the question, why didn't you do this before? For shame, PUBG, for shame. Detroit and Heavy Rain developer Quantic Dreams loses employment court case against a staff member who quit due to Photoshop due to a Photoshop montage scandal. Controversial game studio Quantic Dream developer developer of PlayStation exclusives Heavy Rain and Detroit Becomes Human has lost a court case against court case against a former employee. The victim in the case quit their post due to the offensive photoshopped images of employees being circulated at the studio. Images which came to light after a damning joint investigation into toxic workplace culture undertaken by a team of journalists from Le Monde, Can Canard, PC and Mediapart published back in January. I'd love to see them rip Konami apart for this. Now, these reports variously accused Quantic Dream leaders David Cage and Giaume. How do you pronounce that? Giaume, Giaume, de von Daumiere. I don't know how to pronounce that. I legit do not know how to pronounce that. Of inappropriate behavior, overworking staff, and colluding in, or at least turning, a blind eye to a schoolboy culture involving sexist and racist joke. Canard's report, PC, Canard PC's report, NSFW, includes examples of this in montages of staff members' faces photoshopped onto those of Nazi soldiers and nude porn stars. Oh. Oh, oh, no, 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 which were apparently posted up around the studio workplace. Why? Quantic Dream's boss, Quantic Dream boss David Cage said at the time he was shocked. You're shocked? Um, this is your own studio. Why did you not? DO ANYTHING TO SORT THIS! And in a statement published to the studio's Twitter account, Quantic, Bland Quantic Dream blended branded the claim by its own staff as slanderous and part of a smear campaign. Then, in an unprecedented move, and as discovered by Kotaku in April, Quantic Dream began quietly trying to sue these publications, three of France's largest media companies, for publishing their reports. Today's court decision, as detailed online in a series of tweets from game cult journalist Nicholas Tursev centers on the unusual Pristacte employment law. If I can actually pronounce it. It's a complicated and risky step. A French journalist with knowledge of the process explained it explained it to me as a notification of termination made by an employee who considered themselves a victim. By enacting this step, a worker forfeits their employment rights and salary, but can then petition for unfair dismissal. The process is used to expose fallings, failings in the workplace and leaves the worker's case in the hands of an independent labour court which then decides whether the worker 
should be treated as if they were dismissed or resigned and whether they should receive settlement or and unemployment rights. In this case, the, the Quantic Dream staff members' experience at the studio swung the court in their favour. The staff members' decision to quit will now be treated as unfair dismissal with the rights according, accorded to this. Quantic Dream, meanwhile, now has the right to appeal. Several Quantic Dreams, several former Quantic Dreams employees have taken their cases to court. This is the first time the court has found in favour of the employee. Two previous cases were dismissed, one of whom has filed an appeal. Meanwhile, Quantic Dreams attempt to sue French journalists, which shed light on this, on its workplace practices, continues. Well, if it continues, if it keeps going the way it's going. May as well call GG and throw in the towel. And a new update for Metal Gear Solid 5 lets you play as quite. Three years, Konami took you long enough. Konami has released a new patch for their 2015 hit stealth action game Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain. The content updates new online to, to items, a new difficulty level to event FOBs, whatever they are. And popular campaign character Quiet is now available as a playable character in FOB missions. This content update is now available across all platforms, PC, PS4, and Xbox One. The sniper beauty of Metal Gear Solid 5 is finally getting a spot in the roster of playable characters after last seeing Ocelot as an addition a year ago. It's still a surprise that so late, in, so late into the game's life cycle, players get this update. We're not complaining, however, of course. Um, I am, because it took you three years to do this. Quiet is now available, but fans of digital cosplay, be aware that you can't change her outfit or head options. It's the classic quiet look from the campaign only. I am severely disappointed, Konami. Besides her well-known sniping skills, Quiet also packs extraordinary mo mobility with her extremely fast movement speed and unique jumping abilities. Players will be able to reach certain spots that usually require a ladder. With her dash ability, she'll quickly close the distance to enemies, giving you the extra edge while standing still for a little. What will while standing still for a little will turn Quiet stealthy, becoming see-through and harder to spot. Check out the, 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 the screenshots. Yada yada yada. A new difficulty melt event FOB, or hard in brackets, has also been included with this update, which will enable online players to earn even more event points and there is no risk of retaliation. Your defending player will invade your base later as revenge. So you can steal materials and abduct staff without the fear of repercussions. Doesn't that make it easier? Other contents of this patch include um, a new other contents of this patch are new online development items. Yada 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 yada, and that's it. Worst article this week. <coughs> Ugh. That is not pleasant. That is not pleasant. I hate my throat not being 100%. It's brutal. Ah. Ah. Right, good news for disability gamers. Xbox Adaptive Controller has special disability friendly packing. Packaging. Excellent. Unboxing videos for Microsoft dis disabled friendly controller are going to be interesting as the packaging has be has as the packaging has some very special features. Microsoft has already earned justified a 
claim for its new Xbox adaptive controller. Justified more like universal acclaim. Which is specially designed for gamers with disabilities. But they've really gone the extra mile when it comes to packaging. The special controller has two large program programmable buttons and multiple connectors that can be attached to a whole range of other accessories. The idea being that it allows people that can't hold or use traditional controllers to play normal video games. And when the box arrives, they won't need to they won't need anyone else to open it for them as it's been specifically designed so you can do it with the absolute minimum of effort. A lot of these limited mobility gamers are actually used, used to opening packages with their teeth. Microsoft's Mark, Vi Mark Visor told The Verge, we want to deliver an empowering unboxing experience. Modern packaging can be a mo modern packaging can be a pain even for able-bodied people, but the adaptive controller has all manner of peelable loops, hinges, and levers to make it least to make it as easy as possible. The adaptive controller will be released this September in the US for ninety nine dollars or about seventy four quid. There's no UK date yet, but it's expected to be available around at around the same time. Hmm. Excellent. Well, I know what I'm getting one of my friends for Christmas. And we've got one more article to do. An opinion article here on Game Informer, Brian Shea. Xbox is doing a great job listening to its fans this generation. Oh, you might want to go back to the before the start of the generation when, uh, yeah, Xbox One launch anyone? The initial reveal and subsequent launch of Xbox One was less than ideal for Microsoft. Marred by DRM concerns, mm -hmm. a shoddy Connect focused interface, mm -hmm. and inferior hardware, mm -hmm. Xbox relinquished its last gen lead to large to largely play second launch of PlayStation this generation. While PS4 has continued selling well, delivering an arguably stronger lineup of exclusive titles, the Xbox team has slowly improved its standing and won back the Xbox faithful by listening and reacting to its community in a way never before seen in the console space. Recovering from early tumult. The signs that Xbox would need to listen to its community more came early, as the the company quickly backpedaled on popular announcements prior to launch. Xbox One's initial reveal fostered overwhelming hostility surrounding restrictions of offline play and used games while making players buy a connect with their console and carrying a higher price point than the competition. With such, with such a groundswell of negativity, Microsoft had no choice but to roll back these announcements. Sony further shined a light on X Microsoft's blunders during this time by producing a short sketch at E3 2013. Oh, this was hilarious. Starring PlayStation's executives Shuhei Yoshida and Adam Boyce, which showed how easy it is, it is to share the used games on PlayStation 4. This dunk was seen as one of the ultimate mic drop moments in E3 history and further served to crystallize the problem in a meme-friendly way. From there, Microsoft knew that real transformation had to take place to salvage its upcoming console. Microsoft began pivoting, rolling back its controversial stance on always online requirements and used game restrictions. It proved too little too late for Xbox One's launch later that year, as Sony pulled away to an early and decisive sales lead it has maintained to this day. Former Xbox president Don Matrick, curse you, departed shortly thereafter. Good. His replacement, current executive vice president of gaming, Phil Spencer, 
Did he take over that role from uh, Kevin Butler, anyone? Had the task of rebuilding the relationship with the Xbox faithful. Upon his appointment to this spot, Spencer told us his primary focus was to reassure Xbox's hardcore base in the wake of a launch that centered more on entertainment apps than actual games. My goal, first and foremost, is to make sure that everybody understands that Xbox is a gaming brand and it's going to be gaming first, Spencer told us in 2014. That's a leadership principle that I will bring to the program from day one. Spencer also committed to listening to the community to right the wrongs that led to the rough launch in a 2014 interview with Xbox Live's major, uh, Xbox Live's Larry Major Nelson, HRYB, Hrib. Spencer explained the importance of interacting with the hardcore fans and paying attention to things like social media and internet forums. That two-way dialogue between us and the fans will be important as we drive this product forward, he said. I think this I think it's going to be a foundational element to the culture of this organization. I want the two-way dialogue. We hear what fans say, they have great ideas, and we should use that as an input to how we build our product. While many executives make similar declarations, the actions the Xbox team has taken since show these words were not empty. Microsoft quickly abandoned the unpopular Kinect peripheral and began selling a cheaper version of the system that was in line with the pricing of the PlayStation 4. The Xbox One X console, One S console, revision in 2016, added HDR support, something PlayStation 4 featured in its base models and 4K support for Blu-rays and video streaming, which are still not offered by Sony, even on the PlayStation 4 Pro. FAIL! In addition, the new Xbox One controllers added features like Bluetooth integration and a built-in headphone jack. The platform adjustments didn't stop there, as Microsoft's ultimate vision for the Xbox One was yet to come. And there we go. That is it for this week's edition of the podcast. Tomorrow, Tom and Jerry sins as always. Uh, the countdown. Uh, 30 days to go until F1 2018 goes live on my channel. In the meantime, hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized as following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the Latter-day Saints Notification Squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Uh, chicken Run on the left, podcast on the right. I'll see you tomorrow for Tom and Jerry Sins. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day. Peace out, stay faithful as always.